We are nearing the 24 hour mark tonight. A standoff on the city's far northeast side now nearing 23 hours and counting. San Antonio police called to a home on Sunrise Creek near Ben's Engelman Road just before 1130 last night. Officers still keeping us far away from the scene. As you can tell, this is a live view from Sky 12. This is happening just outside of Kirby. Police say a man fired off shots, then barricaded himself inside the home. It was a different scene, though, last night as officers dealt with rain. SWAT officers surrounded the home after a neighbor told police his property was hit by gunfire. Police say the suspect wasn't bar barricaded in the home alone. We're told a 14 year old managed to get out safely. Police have not mentioned the relationship between the minor and the suspect. A house of worship new on the night beat thousands of dollars worth of instruments stolen from a West Side church. It comes just as they prepare for their first in person mass. The St. Paul Catholic Church's Congolese choir is now left wondering how they're going to perform. The night team's Patty Santos caught up with those at the church. It's sad that a building that is really sacred, that a building that was open to everybody was broken into. From outside, they broke in this. And Workers that. at the House of Mercy building, part of St. Paul Catholic Church, found a side door had been breached and someone had rifled through the entire building Sunday night. As any of you who have lost anything, you know how it's a sense of defilement. Missing were the computer used to broadcast mass, guitars, amplifiers, microphones, and cords, among other items used mostly by the Congolese Catholic Choir of San Antonio. Seen here performing with those instruments. Most of the instruments, I bought them with my own money, and it's, it breaks my heart. I invested it a lot for the sake of the choir. For the community's safety, they want the thief caught. The main concern is what happens here at St. Paul's could happen in any any home in our neighborhood. With only a set of drums and an amplifier left, the choir will have to cancel an upcoming event until they can replace or borrow the instruments. It's going to be also the first opening mass at May 24th. Hopefully by then we can have some uh, equipment uh, back. It will be the first in-person mass since the stay-at-home orders were lifted by the state. They pray for justice, but grace for the thieves. And if the gentleman could know that he entered into a house of mercy and God's mercy is always there, even if you steal my computer. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. And despite a quiet day today, it's been an active weather pattern. Earlier this morning before sunrise, we had some decent rainfall move through town. We'll talk about those accumulations in a bit, but we're also looking ahead to the next system that's going to be affecting us. And right now it's just a little ripple in the upper level flow near Phoenix and Tucson in southern Arizona. That's going to continue to push eastward as it does. It's likely to amplify, get a bit stronger, move into town and by tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening, start firing off storms in West Texas and even into Mexico. Thereafter, that storm activity moves towards San Antonio. We'll talk more about this in detail and talk about the main severe weather threats coming right up. Thank you, Adam. A new case of COVID-19 at an HEB, the grocery store chain, confirming this case linked to someone who worked at a store in New Braunfels. HEB says that partner was last in the store in the 600 block of Walnut, on May 5th, HEB also says all partners at the location have been notified and the store has been deep cleaned and sanitized multiple times with several safety measures in place. The store says, quote, our primary focus is keeping our partners and customers safe End quote a reminder. One of those safety protocols is wearing masks. The employer has a right to do that. How many signs you see no shirts, no shoes, no service. And they certainly have the right to do that, and we're encouraging them to do that. Um, it, it's, it's really the most important tool we've got is the employers requiring that, and most of them have posted right on their door. Coming up later in the newscast, a look at the type of materials to consider when wearing face coverings. Let's take a look at the latest numbers now. Bear County reporting 2,041 positive cases of COVID-19 tonight. The total number of deaths increasing by one again tonight for a total of 59 cases. More than 1,000 people have recovered so far. 931 cases remain active with 65 cases so severe those patients had to be hospitalized. 
A new route of pop up testing also began today, but the amount of tests provided remains the same. A couple of new sites were open. Only 150 tests, though, are being administered at the Southside Lions Community Center on Hiawatha Street and the other site at the Claude Black Community Center on East Commerce. Also, only testing 150 people a day. Last week, Metro Health said they planned on increasing the amount of testing at walk up sites. Today, they said they're still working on making that happen. Both pop up sites will be back open tomorrow as well as Saturday. Testing begins at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Remember, you don't need any symptoms. Testing is free. You don't need a doctor's order. You don't even need an appointment. The Bear County Jail is hoping to ramp up testing. More than 300 inmates have tested positive, but not all of them are at the jail. So where are they? The night team Stephen Cavazos breaks down the numbers for us tonight. We've actually had uh, some pretty significant jump in the number of positive uh, inmates uh, in the Bear County Jail. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salasad says 44 new cases of COVID-19 were reported overnight at the jail. Salasad says inmates who work in the kitchen area had a possible exposure to the virus. Salasad says those inmates were quarantined and tested. A good number uh, at this point have come back positive for COVID. The inmates remain quarantined and the total number of cases inside the jail now stands at 297. 150 in inmates are tested daily, but the sheriff says University Health System is working to increase that number. They've made some upgrades to their testing procedures to where now they can they can actually go well above that. In total, 386 inmates have tested positive for the virus. The jail breaks down those numbers with 61 inmates fully recovered and 14 released. Those numbers also include 13 in the recovery unit and one death. But during tonight's briefing, the city reported far less. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf explains why. The numbers that he gets are a little bit ahead of what uh, comes in to the uh, uh, to the system here. Right now, 1,300 inmates have been tested, but the judge says it's no easy task with the jail being a transit area. Uh, this is not a population that remains there. Sheriff Salazar says he's expecting the number of cases to increase and wants people to know testing in the jail is critical. This building is no different than the rest of society. Stephen Cavasso's case at 12 News. Well, there will not be a 60 day grace period for residents behind on rent in San Antonio. The proposed ordinance failed by a single vote during today's city council meeting. If passed, it would have required landlords to give a notice of proposed eviction 60 days before they could begin the actual eviction process. This would give renters a chance to catch up on payments. Numerous landlords who came to speak at the meeting strongly opposed the idea and council members worried about possible Possible legal challenges. It's irresponsible tenants that, is, that this ordinance helps. With the stroke of a pen, you will make me bankrupt. I do not want another lawsuit because the city cannot afford one, both literally and figuratively. Dallas and Austin have adopted similar ordinances meant to give renters more protection from evictions. Let's take a look tonight at the cases of COVID-19 in our surrounding counties. Hayes County poll that has an underlying health condition is is uh, in jeopardy when they come to the poll and stand in a line. Despite today's resolution, the state of Texas is not interpreting the law the same way. In fact, the state is facing several legal challenges from voters and civil rights organizations attempting to expand the vote by mail. Right now, it's unclear what will happen. Bear County runoff elections, by the way, are scheduled for July. Still ahead on the night beat, a new viewpoint during the Thunderbirds flyover over San Antonio. And tonight's coronavirus Q&A featuring a local business owner with a message. The event they have planned to show unity tomorrow coming up. And we introduce you to a family who is helping those facing tough times. Two students forced off campus because of the pandemic and the Seguin family that stepped up to help. It's coming up next. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. It's a story we've been following and an arrest we've been expecting. Children found starved and neglected in Wilson County last week. Today we have learned the grandmother of the children has now been charged in that case. 41-year-old Samantha Foster is charged with three counts of endangerment of a child. The Wilson County Sheriff says she is currently in jail after being picked up on a warrant yesterday. No word yet on the bond amounts. 
And while times can be tough, the human spirit can be tougher. We've heard stories of people stepping up to help others during this pandemic. This is one of those stories. A Seguin family opened the doors to their home and gave Texas Lutheran University students a place to stay after their campus had to close. Tiffany Huertas shares their story. All of the plans that we had for like our senior year have just gone out the windows. In March, Texas Lutheran University senior Delaney Chambers learned she would need to move off campus due to COVID-19. A spokesperson for the university says they asked students to move off campus for health and safety reasons. Delaney says that day she received a text message from her mom. It just said, how can I help you and your friends? Two of Delaney's friends from school are from out of town and had nowhere to go. So on March 30th, they moved in with her family in Seguin. It's not like we've had two strangers move in. It's just like we've gained two new family members. Sophomore Johnny Samaniego Lozano and senior Daniel Saunders say they are grateful for everything the family has done for them. I can't be any more grateful for how much they've just inspired me. With this family, it's we always want to be around each other. We always want to have just each other's company and each other's energy. During the pandemic, the students continued to learn online and created many memories with the Chambers family, too. They're all creative geniuses, all of them. And you, there's never a dull moment. There's very few quiet moments, but... It's always fun. It's all, they've actually inspired me to start writing again. The Chambers family even threw Delaney and Daniel a surprise graduation. We do know that not everybody can do this. Not everybody's blessed and capable of doing this. But everybody can do something to help. You know, we are Americans and we're Texans and we always come together in times of need. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. It's an awesome story. Love, Love it. Well, birthdays are a major milestone to celebrate. One man who has dealt with medical issues is celebrating another year of life. Arnulfo Ibarra had to have his leg amputated and has been facing treatment for an infection. He's been a lot of time in the hospital, but his family was determined to celebrate his 66th birthday. There was a parade of cars at Baptist Hospital for him. Ibarra's wife says there's one thing to keep in mind as families deal with the with these tough times. Be together and take care of each other and try to make each other happy. That always works. The parade was organized with the help of family, nurses, and staff. Happy. All right, a new perspective tonight. By the way, I was wishing happy birthday, Mr. Barr. I don't know if I got lost. We showed you several angles from yesterday's flyover San Antonio with the Air Force Thunderbirds. Look at this one. This is a view from the cockpit of one of those jets. This is video released from the flyover in San Antonio and Austin. The flights were meant to salute healthcare workers as they continue to work the front lines amid this pandemic. That's amazing That's great... to see it so up close like that. Yeah, and we've got it on our website, KSAT.com. Awesome. Let's take a live look outside with live cam this evening. A pretty quiet day, Adam, but you guys are gearing up for a very active one tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow during the day will be all right. It's tomorrow night that will be uh, ready to roll here for some thunderstorms, some of which could be strong and severe. And actually the primary threats tomorrow night will be straight line winds. With this kind of event, usually straight line winds are the primary threat, but also flash flooding. So we've got moderate risks of the wind gusts, maybe 60, possibly 70 miles per hour in some isolated locations. Flash flooding because we've had a decent amount of rainfall lately. It's nice to be able to say that. Hail is a moderate risk, but on the lower end of moderate and the tornado risk is low in this situ situation. Not zero, but low. All right, it's all about the rain. Let's take a look at the rainfall from late last night and early this morning. We got the leftovers from some West Texas storms. They even gave us a little thunder and lightning early this morning in the pre-dawn hours. Some good rainfall accumulations, a nice swath through the hill country, even down into Bear County. I'd say just by glancing at it on average, we probably got about a half an inch across Bear County. Bernie, six tenths of an inch. I know that's just outside of Bear County. Downtown, we got an inch. Stinson point four four along with St. Hedwig. Rio Medina over an inch along with Castorville and Seguin about half an inch. So it's all quiet outside right now. Just fine. The little ripple in the flow that helped give us some rain earlier today. It's over New Orleans. So we're looking off to the west and now we're starting to see this 
next dip or little ripple in the upper upper level flow develop. It's starting to actually be a little more noticeable and it'll continue to strengthen and amplify through tonight into tomorrow and notice by seven o'clock tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening. It should start to fire off some fairly widespread showers and storms in West Texas and right along the Rio Grande. That's at 7 p.m. tomorrow evening. Again, most of the day just fine. A OK, a lot like what we had earlier today and we get to the 10 o'clock hour hill country down to Eagle Pass, Carrizo Springs right now. It's impossible to give you an exact time. It'll hit San Antonio, but I think the best time frame would be anywhere from about 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. OK, that's when we're expecting it around here, and it does come with the risk of power outages along with the flash flooding and straight line winds as well because we could get a lot of lightning with this and that often causes power outages. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. Maybe have that flashlight ready to go in your nightstand or next to your bed tomorrow night. Then as you get towards sunrise on Saturday, it's all east of here and moves out of town and actually the weekend overall is looking pretty good. Now, yes, we could still use some more rainfall. We all know that it'd be nice to have more rain. This is looking like a faster event than we previously anticipated, so it's not going to be as prolonged, meaning not as much potential for the really heavy rain. It'll be a good hit, and I think a good portion of our viewing area will get about one to two inches of rain, some locally higher amounts, of course, and we could use it. Here's the latest drought monitor updated today, but it does not take into account the very recent rainfall that we had. Keep that in mind. The data is good as of early Tuesday morning. Then they assess it, then they issue it on Thursday. So we just got the drought monitor, but clearly we could use it. Even good part of Bear County and neighboring counties as well to the north and west in a moderate drought. Temperature wise, let's change subjects here. Low 80s here in town, upper 70s in many locations. Canyon Lake at 80, still 88 in Del Rio tomorrow morning. We'll wake up to temperatures in the lower 70s. Low clouds again to start the day. You'll notice the humidity. Sunny and pleasant most of the afternoon. 90 degrees, maybe an isolated pop up storm 5 6 o'clock by 9 p.m. That's when we're expecting those storms to develop out west thereafter, especially around midnight, give or take. That's when they would likely be hitting San Antonio. So pretty widespread thunderstorm complex expected tomorrow. We'll be here. We'll keep an eye on it overall. The weekend looking fine low in the high temperatures in the 80s and a little mixture of sun and clouds for you. Thank you, Adam. All right, in the middle of this pandemic, this local athlete had to worry about football, but more importantly, his family. Greg. Yeah, this kind of caught us off guard. Larry Ramirez is interviewing Ramon Richards via Skype, or if it should be Facebook, Facebook. What? And so that led to this. When we come back, Ramon Richards, remember him, the former Los Angeles Ram, former Brackenridge Eagle, and now a member of a Canadian football team, tells us the big story when we come back. And the Robinsons, that's right, David and David, team up for SA Give coming up. unnatural closeout that the league has outlawed years ago and pays great attention to it. And we're up 23 points in the third quarter against Golden State. And Kawhi goes down like that. And you want to know how we feel? That's how we feel. Follow up. <laughs> Three years ago today, the world changed with the Spurs and Zaza Pachulia stuck out his foot and knocked Kawhi Leonard out of the playoffs in game one of the Western Conference Finals. That's after going up by as many as 25 points. Eventually led to Kawhi's departure from San Antonio and arguably their last shot at an NBA title in the foreseeable future in big board sports. But first. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Former Brackenridge standout and Los Angeles Ram Ramon Richards revealing today to KSA 12 Sports that both his parents suffered from the coronavirus here in San Antonio. It was up to him and his brother and sister to help them recover. Ramon is no longer with the Rams, made the revelation during a FaceTime interview with our own Larry Ramirez today, where he said his father, Ramon Sr., and his mom, Ruth Murray, both came down with the disease, and it was a scary time for him and his siblings. When I came, when I went home in, uh, in March, 
my parents actually had it. And uh, my brother and I, you know, took care of them real, real well. Um, and stayed with them for them for a couple for a couple weeks, and just made sure that they were back to health before I came back to Cali. So it was, it was scary though. It was scary. Um, at one point, I really thought I was gonna lose them, but it was uh, everybody just stayed strong, and eventually, you know, they pushed through. Thank goodness, Ramon tells us both of his parents have since recovered and now excited for his new challenge in pro football career. After signing as an undrafted free agent with the Los Angeles Rams out of Oklahoma State, the defensive back was cut by L.A. in 2019. Tells us he's just been picked up by the Calgary Stampeders of the Canadian Football League. It's a very, very gracious opportunity for me. Um, a lot of stress relieved. Um, now I have something to work toward. Like before that, I'm working hard, we're working out but there's no guarantee you'll get an opportunity. But in my head, I knew I would get one eventually, so I wasn't worried about it. And now I have something like, okay, this is it. This is your team. This, you have a team that you can call your team. It just gives like extra motivation in the workout. Now, the CFL would normally be starting their training camps right now, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Richards tells us they're planning to report it in early July. The Spurs are facing bigger problems in trying to win another NBA championship. Like the rest of the world, the team's focus is helping the San Antonio community recover from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And one way they decided to help is through the Spurs Give Together Fund, where they hope to raise $1 million to support first responders, provide for families impacted by the coronavirus, and inspire local commerce. Today's Spurs NBA champion, Hall of Famer David Robinson, along with son David Robinson Jr., have teamed up to help with this project by Spurs Sports and Entertainment. And during an interview on Zoom today, the Amber was asked how he thought San Antonio had responded to the crisis. I, I think we've done a, a very good job here. Um, you know, I see the mayor has been very active. The governor has been very active. Um, and, and and I see just the, in general, the, the, the generosity here is phenomenal. This community is unique. It's unique for a lot of reasons. It's much more of a family feel community than any that I've ever been in. And, and I think we've responded like a family. David Jr. has returned to San Antonio after you watched him grow up, going to school in Austin, the University of Texas, spending some time in New York before returning home, and was asked about following in his father's footsteps and stepping up for the Alamo City. The Spurs team asked me to join the board, which I've been really honored, and it's been awesome to be a part of it. You know, the, the, to be kind of adding on to the, some of the legacy that, that my father started, especially in the east side with Carver Academy and, and something I, I saw kind of you know, growing up and, and to hopefully you know, continue that moving forward in new ways and, and, and build on it. If you would like to help, you can go to SpursGive.org slash together. Not only is NASCAR coming back, so is driver Ryan Newman from a near-death experience next. Not only is NASCAR returning to live racing this Sunday, but so is Ryan Newman after his near-death experience. It will be his first race since he nearly lost his life in this horrific crash on February the 17th at the finish of the Daytona 500, the first race of the season, only to walk out of the hospital with his daughters 48 hours later. Just really wanted to get back in it and at it. And um, I've been working really hard to uh, do the things that I needed to do uh, test-wise to you know, pass my concussion testing protocol and things like that so that I could could be down there with my team and Dr. Petty to, um, you know, establish the fact that I felt well and, and could prove it. So he's part of the fact that they're going to have this test where there are no fans. They're going to do live racing and they're going to do it all on the same day, the qualifying and the race. The race actually starts at 745 on Sunday night. Interesting. Okay. All in one. All in one day. All right. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Our coronavirus Q&A is next. One local business owner is sharing news of an event that is supposed to send a message amid this pandemic. Next. You follow up to a story we had earlier in the show. This is the grandmother charged in a child abuse case we've been following since Friday. Investigators say trash, feces, urine, and leftover food found littered around a home with three children in Wilson County last week. A mugshot of Samantha Foster has now been released. She's charged with three counts of endangerment of a child. Records actually show the children who are one, two, and four were in foster custody in April of last year. The COVID-19 death toll now topping 300,000 people worldwide with the highest number 
here in the U.S. with more than 85,000 deaths so far. And tonight, the Food and Drug Administration is sharing findings about a test used across the country, including at the White House, to diagnose the virus within minutes. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez with the latest. A new alert from the FDA raising questions about the accuracy of one popular test used to diagnose COVID-19. The agency saying the Abbott ID now point of care test believed to be the same kind given to White House staff and visitors before they interact with the president may return false negatives. The FDA noting that the studies have limitations and the tests which are being researched further can still be used and can correctly identify many positive cases in minutes. With COVID-19 cases still on the rise in some areas, at least 45 states have now eased restrictions, with three more states following suit on Friday. In hard-hit New Jersey, some beaches and boardwalks reopening this weekend. And in Wisconsin, some bars and restaurants are packed after the state Supreme Court struck down the governor's stay-at-home order. If they don't feel that it's good to come out yet, more to them, but I hope they respect my feelings on I would like to come out and I would like to start getting the economy going again. The CDC now out with new guidelines with specific guidance on reopening safely, saying restaurants should encourage social distancing and offer flexible leave for employees. Also recommending that schools and camps that reopen should stagger drop-offs and limit how often kids are together in groups. But in Washington state, some hairdressers petitioning to delay reopening out of concerns for their safety, as some experts continue sounding the alarm about the virus's spread. Dr. Rick Bright, who says he was forced out of his role leading the government's search for a vaccine, testifying before Congress as a whistleblower. Without better planning, 2020 could be the darkest winter in modern history. We still do not have a standard, centralized, coordinated plan to take our nation through this response. Time is running out because the virus is still spreading everywhere. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles. If Starbucks wants a break during this pandemic, the coffee company's COO sent a letter to landlords of stores all over the country asking for a break on rent for a year starting June 1st. He says so social distancing because of COVID-19 has battered Starbucks sales. The rent relief demand comes one day after the company announced it would reopen 90% of its nearly 9,000 company-owned stores here in the U.S. by early June. The letter asked that landlords, quote, adapt to new realities. Here at home, it was referred to as a love letter. It was sent by the Texas Attorney General's Office Tuesday, and it accused the city and county of overreaching their authority regarding emergency orders concerning COVID-19. The Office of State Attorney General Ken Paxton had a problem with the local orders on crowd size and mask procedures. Colin Marks, a professor at St. Mary's University School of Law, says the city's orders are based on the Health and Safety Code and the governor's orders on the government government code. He said that either order would likely end up being challenged in court. The bars are going to start going bankrupt. Uh, restaurants can't continue to handle only 25% and survive. And when you're talking about people's livelihood, they're going to resort to litigation. Mayor Ron Nirenberg says the orders in place at the local level are consistent with the states and even uses the same language as what's in the governor's order. Welcome back. Every night around this time, we interview a range of people about the pandemic, from health experts to the mayor to those who have firsthand knowledge of how this global health crisis is affecting our community. And we are certainly aware that there are people who are hurting out there. And tonight we're joined by Rob Martindale, who is the founder of Big Hops. Rob, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for having us. Talk about turn up the lights. It's something that's going to happen tomorrow uh, from 6 until 10 o'clock the purpose behind this? Well, uh, it was created with the uh, Texas Bar and Nightclub Alliance. Uh, we're pushing it to show unity and solidarity with the bar, tavern, and nightclubs here in Texas or all across the state. We want to show the community that we're ready to open back up and do so with a safety plan in place. What is it going to look like for most bars? Just like so, it says, you're going to turn up the lights, turn on the music? We are. 
we're going to turn up the lights, turn up the music. We're not open to the public. We won't be serving alcohol, uh, but we'll have our employees there. Um, and really just to, again, show solidarity with the industry and that uh, we're going to survive this. And we're also, we are ready and here uh, to go back to serving the community. I mean, I think we've hit what uh, two months since the first case was detected in San Antonio. Is that, uh, what have those two months been like for you to be closed? Well, uh, yes, sir, 55 days ago, we were shut down. So we had to furlough all of our employees uh, immediately. I mean, we had a six hour notice um, and we've lost all revenue. So from, for us, March 18th, we've had zero revenue in. Uh, so it's been tough. And, uh, you know, but we're doing our best. Fortunately, uh, Big Hops is in a position that uh, we'll be able to weather the storm, but there's plenty of uh, other small businesses out there in our industry that might not be able to do so. So it has definitely been hard on everyone. When do you think we're gonna hit the point where we're gonna see, I mean, uh, Jody Newman, uh, the owner of the Friendly Spot told us at six o'clock, she thought we were at about 30% of the bars that are closed down right now may not be able to reopen. I mean, is there a point of no return for Big Hops? Uh, I try not to think of that point. Uh, we have a ways to go, but I would say the 30% is probably a, a good guesstimation. I mean, it could be worse. If this goes, let's say another month or two, that number starts skyrocketing. I know. A lot I think now we've been through two months worth of expenses and we're going to get start getting where most businesses will be on the end of the rope. I know that you've been doing a lot of work at the state level too, uh, talking to the governor, uh, trying to get him to reopen bars. Are you optimistic that that's going to happen in the next few weeks here? I am optimistic. Uh, through the Texas Restaurant Association and, uh, and the Texas Bar and Nightclub Alliance, uh, we've submitted a proposal to the governor with a safety plan in place and how we can open safely to serve the community uh, while taking care of the employees safety-wise and the customers. So we, we feel pretty confident that it's based you know, on science, it's based with the health experts here in Texas and uh, 20 other bars around the state got together to put, put the proposal in place. So we think it's a, a logical plan and we think it'll get their attention. How big is this industry we're talking about in San Antonio when you talk about hospitality and you talk about the service industry? There's uh, 5,500 bars taverns and nightclubs that were closed on, on uh, March 20th. So over 75,000 people or Texans lost their job that night. Yeah. It's probably re sales revenue since then, they've estimated it's over 620 million, which equates to about 42 million in lost tax revenue to the state as well. So it, it's significant. Talk about the balancing act that, you know, just because you open doesn't mean people are gonna automatically come back. So there's gotta be a balancing act that you make the customer feel like he's gonna be in a safe environment, correct? Correct. Uh, on our side, we're gonna do everything possible uh, to make them feel comfortable. Uh, employees wearing masks, gloves, hand sanitizer at the front door, things like that. Uh, social distancing in the, in the, inside the premise and out on our patios. What do you and want it'll our- be, It'll be significant. What do you want our viewers to take what message do you want them to take with them tonight and maybe tomorrow as they drive around and they see some of these bars with the lights on and the music going? I want everyone to understand we are still here and we are ready to return and serve you safely. Rob Martindale with Big Hops. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us, Rob. Great. Thank you, Steve. All right. Take care. We'll be right back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. The doctors have said it again and again. Face coverings can protect yourself and others. Covering your mouth and nose is essential. The material your mask is made of can also play a factor in your face coverings effectiveness. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez shares what experts are saying. They come in all kinds of colors, styles, and fabrics, and with lots of variety in effectiveness, too. That's not always one size fits all. It turns out the fit is just one part of what experts say determines how well your mask actually works for helping prevent the spread of COVID-19. 
some of the best things that you can do are to make sure that the mask fits closely on your face. If the mask is fitting improperly, air is actually being funneled downward and inward on the sides of the mask directly into the nostrils and into the nasal passages. And that's exactly what we don't want. The material matters too. The CDC advising all masks should allow for breathing without restriction, fit snugly but comfortably, and include multiple layers of fabric. Tightly woven cotton cloth, something approximating the weave of a bandana. Certainly not a looser weave, like the kind of material or knit that a sweater is made out of. The holes in that type of material are much too large. But microbiologist Dr. Rachel Noble points out that anything too thick can restrict breathing. And she recommends staying away from designs with things like sequins and glitter, with porous fabric that can harbor bacteria more than regular cloth and can be itchy, likely causing the person wearing it to touch his or her face more. And experts say to wash masks at least every day or two. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles. At all them years you've been in school, you're going to walk across somebody's stage if I have to build you one myself. One Memphis area father wouldn't let his daughter's hard work go unnoticed. Gabrielle Pierce graduated from Xavier University and her father built a ceremony in her front yard. A stage, podium, personal protective equipment for everyone in attendance to honor his daughter. Many graduating seniors also getting quite the send off with commencement addresses being done by celebrities. Former President Barack Obama will give an address this weekend. That's awesome. I do. Fathers That's love exactly. for his daughter to do that. Let's take a live look outside with City Cam 82 degrees right now, Adam. Yeah, 82. We'll see temperatures fall about another 10 degrees until tomorrow morning. And really what we're looking ahead to is tomorrow night. That's when we have the chance for thunderstorms. But between now and then, some decent weather. And tomorrow's going to be a lot like today, at least in terms of the high temperature, right around 90 degrees. Today we started at 65, made it to 93, and had just about half an inch of rain in the rain gauge. That's at the airport in San Antonio. And most of Bear County, about half an inch. 90s, very popular across Texas this afternoon. All right, let's take a look at our satellite and radar. Nothing going on locally right now. You head off to the east, Louisiana, Mississippi. We've got a little bit of activity there. That's the leftovers of what we had last night and early this morning. We're tracking a new disturbance in the upper levels that's moving through northern Mexico, and it's going to amplify and become a little bit stronger during the day tomorrow. So by tomorrow evening, it's firing off thunderstorms. West Texas, and even parts of Mexico. So west of San Antonio around sunset, we should start to see those thunderstorms flare up. Then as we go through the evening, 10 o'clock, parts of the hill country down toward about Crystal City, Carrizo Springs area. And then closer to midnight, 1 a.m. ish, give or take, is when this complex of storms should move into San Antonio. But by sunrise, it's pretty much all out of our area. I mean, even by 5 a.m. it's along the coastal plain, and I think this computer model has one of the better handles on it. There is some difference in timing, but the general stratification, that linear uh, basically organization to the storms is pretty consistent amongst a lot of our high res guidance. Now with that, the primary risk will likely be straight line winds, maybe a 60, 70 mile per hour gust here and there. Also flash flooding, and there is a moderate risk for hail. It's on the lower end of moderate, but still we could have some pockets of larger hail, meaning about an inch to an inch and a half in diameter. Tornado threat, it's low, it's not zero, but it's definitely low. So 73 degrees tomorrow morning, 80 at noon, right near 90 by the afternoon hours. Overall, a great day tomorrow and a southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15. It's tomorrow by 9 p.m. We'll start to see those storms along the border. And then thereafter, tomorrow night into the pre-dawn hours on Saturday, we'll be here covering it for you. And should we need to, we'll be on air for sure as well. And then most of the weekend, looking dry, high temperatures in the 80s, and maybe a pop-up shower east of town on Sunday. But this is our next really good shot at rainfall. I mean, we've been lucky here for a stretch of days, but this could help us out with another one to two inches in spots. Thank you, Adam. With many homeowners spending more time at home, the question over refinancing continues to come up. The tips to consider around the corner. And a recall alert, the chest of drawers that has led to concerns for parents and their children. It's coming up next on the Night Beat.
After sharp, sharp losses earlier in the day, stocks closed out today on the rebound. The Dow climbed 1.6%. The S&P increased a little more than 1%. And NASDAQ also rising, but by less than 1%. It's been a roller coaster on Wall Street. And or the roller coaster on Wall Street continues as investors continue to weigh the reopening of the economy and a grim outlook for growth. Meantime, a recall alert to tell you about a chest of drawers sold at many of the nation's largest retailers can tip over and injure or even kill children. The piece of furniture is made by Hoda and weighs 84 pounds. It stands a bit more than three feet tall. Walmart, Amazon, Wayfair, Home Depot and other retailers sold more than 26,000 of these units between July of 2017 and April of this year. Owners should check the Consumer Product Safety Commission for contact information or for a free anchoring kit or refund. The rush to refinance is on as the economy sputters. Mortgage rates continue to fluctuate around record low territory, three to three and a half percent for a 30 year loan. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz with a look at the savings and who should consider refinancing. This is a, an aluminum window. Thanks to good timing, John Andrade now has the cash to fix up his family's home. He just refinanced his 30 year mortgage. We hit at right at 3%. At a basement low rate. We're saving uh, several hundred a month uh, on, our, on our mortgage payment and we were able to get cash back to do projects around the house or to just save. Refinancing applications have gone through the roof with people taking advantage of cheap loans, saving real money by locking in lower rates or chopping the length of the loan. By lowering the term is where you see true savings. That's when you're truly building wealth in your property. Loan officer Scott Caroselli says switching to a 10 or 15 year note can save you tens of thousands of dollars over the length of the loan. So who should consider refinancing? I would say that if you are at an interest rate at four and a half percent or higher, you should seriously consider a refinance. Depending on how many years remain on your loan. So what can you expect if you want to refinance your home loan now? Well, the pandemic has slowed a lot of processes down and this is no exception. The crush of applications has created a backlog and the economy has changed. Because of COVID-19 are a little bit more strict now. The credit score requirements have gone up considerably. For Andrade, though, the process was fast, easy, and worth it. It just made sense to do it. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. We've got some breaking news right now from our city's east side. A crash involving a train and a pedestrian. A man near the intersection of Palmetto and Westfall. That's near I-10 and South New Braunfels. Patty Santos is on scene right now. And Patty, what are you learning? Yeah, this is pretty incredible. The fire department telling us that this man was run over by about eight train cars and he, they managed to get him out with just a, a foot injury. Apparently the uh, initial report right now is that the train conductor saw the man lying in the middle of the train tracks and immediately stopped uh, when crews were able to get here. They were able to pull him out. He is alert, but that is what we're learning right now. We're going to continue to follow this and bring you more as we get it on KSAT. We'll send it back to you. Thank you, Patty. We'll be right back. Yeah, it's amazing. All right, check this out. A 10-year-old girl and her father using their time at home to finish a book. The father-daughter duo in Massachusetts raising thousands of dollars for Feeding America from proceeds of sales. The book is called Darien the Librarian and tells the story about a girl who can magically jump in and out of books. My dad wanted to publish it, but I didn't want to. I wanted to make a fundraiser about it because we already have all the money we need. What would we do with the extra? And some people can't put food on the table. She's so sweet. She is. Yeah. They've already raised more than $20,000. People are still getting their hands on the books by donating to the cause and then reading the Facebook page, Feeding America. That is awesome. Yeah. 
Adam thinks she should have listened to her dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I understand as a father of yeah, I, know, with, I know. You I want know. to get him to college somehow. <laughs> yeah, they don't have an idea of yeah. finances yet. <laughs> Publishing could have been a good option too, but I'm glad they went their route. Yes. I am. <laughs> so tomorrow, most of the day, dad yeah, just fine. It's tomorrow <laughs> night into the pre dawn hours on Saturday when we're expecting a storm complex to move through. We'll keep you updated. Mike and Justin will be here in the morning and they'll give you the very latest as well. So we'll keep you posted. Posted. Sorry to call you out there. <laughs> That's it for the night beat. Good morning, San Antonio. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, San Antonio starts at 4:30. Good night.